Good morning, I'm Wayworn Worm, and welcome to my channel. And welcome back to the Monster Manual Backward, where today we're going to talk about the Guard and the Knight. We're almost done with Appendix B. I think we only have two or three more episodes, so let's do this. So the Guard, a medium humanoid, any race, any alignment... Decent armor class with a chain shirt and shield. Uh, armor class of 16. Uh, 2d8 plus 2 hit points, which averages out to 11. 30 feet of speed. Uh, plus 1 in strength, plus 1 dex. Well, it goes 13, 12, 12, 10, 11, 10. Uh, skills are perception with a passive perception of 12. Pretty good. Uh, languages, any one language, usually common, and challenge one-eighth. And they can do an attack with a spear, plus three to hit, uh, range of five feet, or it can be thrown, d6 plus one piercing, averages to four, or d8 plus one piercing if used with two hands to make a melee attack, which means they would have to drop their shield which would lower their armor class to 14. Guards include members of a city watch, sentries in a citadel, or fortified town, and the bodyguards of mercenaries and nobles. And... How would I use them? Um, probably as... as described. Um... I talk a little bit more about them in my Gladiator episode, which was last week's episode, where a guard can be used as a lower-level gladiator, or a gladiator as a higher-level guard. I would also probably use a guard for, like, a low-level soldier. Just like your normal infantrymen, especially because D and D is vaguely late medieval, early Renaissance period, and most infantrymen from that time period that were trained enough uh, and valued enough to have a chain shirt would be, um, well, probably pikemen, but spear works just as well. So, that's probably how I'd use it is, you know, as a city watch, as town watch, as sentries. Um, if merchants and nobles were traveling the countryside, they would have guards, um, maybe even a gladiator or two to be a high-level guard. And how would I go about changing them? I, as as I've said with all of these stat box in Appendix B, and I'm sure this is starting to get a little old, but the easiest, quickest, first thing you can do to change the stat block up a bit is pick a race. And since they've got 13 strength and 11 wisdom, something that gives at least plus one to either strength or wisdom, that's going to bump up those two stats. Um, and your common guards are going to be like dwarves and humans, some half-orcs, any, uh, goliaths, anything that ups the strength because, you know, strong guards. But I'd also think it'd be fun to see like an elven guard. Um, or like a halfling or a gnome, you know, something that's out of what you're normally going to see. And what I feel like you're normally going to see is either a human or something that gives a big bonus to strength. Um, now, if you pick human, um, it would actually probably be better to take the variant human and give one to strength and one to wisdom to up those. 
And then there are several good feats that you can pick, uh, including Sentry, uh, which will stop movement of things going... Uh, basically, one of the things that... Or it's Sentinel. That's the name of the feat. One of the things that it does is uh, anytime someone moves in your range and you attack them, if you successfully hit, their movement speed goes down to zero. And... That that's kind of what guards do. Um, it's just they're they're there to stop you from going to the other side of them, because they're protecting something that's on the other side. Um, but there are several. I think there's like a polearm master. Um, yeah, there's a lot of feats that you could give them, and with a variant human, there you go. Another easy thing, change out their a weapon. Um, maybe, maybe you go to a town where the town guards all have great swords. And so they don't have shields and they don't have a spear. They just have large swords that do large amounts of damage. Uh, great sword doing 2d6. So that would be another thing to do. Um, maybe if it's like a town watch, instead of the chain shirt, you might want to give them, say, studded leather or leather armor. Uh, something to show that this town isn't as rich it's not as able to give good uh weaponry to its people or maybe you go the opposite way and you know in a massive citadel all of the guards wear plate armor so that's a fun thing that that obviously changes their armor class um a guard with leather armor and a shield and a spear. I think that puts their armor class down at about 14. Um, take away their shield. It's going to put him at like 12 or 13. So that's going to be pretty easy to hit, especially with only 11 hit points those town guards are going to be very, very fragile. Whereas uh, guards with shields in plate mail are going to have an armor class of like 20 or 21. And that's going to be really hard to hit, uh, especially because they're challenge level 1 8th. By the time it's really easy for you to hit, you're probably going to hit one hit kill them. By the time you get up to those to the levels where you can consistently hit a twenty tw or twenty one armor class, so that's I feel like that's about all on the guard. Let us move on to our next thing, the knight. And as we move on to the knight. It is also a medium humanoid, any race, any alignment. Their armor class is 18 uh, with their plate mail. They have 52 hit points, 8d8 plus 16, with a speed of 30 feet. 16 strength, 11 dexterity, 14 constitution, 11 intelligence, 11 wisdom, and 15 charisma. With saving throws in constitution and wisdom... A passive perception of 10. They speak any one language, usually common. And their challenge rating 3. They have the ability Brave. The knight has advantage on saving throws against being frightened. And they can make two melee attacks with a great sword, uh, which has plus 5 to hit, reach of 5 feet, does 2d6 plus 3 slashing. They also have a heavy crossbow, plus two to hit, 
with and it does 1d10 piercing damage. They also have the ability leadership. For one minute, the knight can utter a special command or warning whenever a non-hostile creature that it can see within 30 feet of it makes an attack roll or a saving roll. The creature can add a d4 to its roll provided it can hear and understand the knight. A creature can benefit from only one leadership die at a time. This effect ends if the knight is incapacitated. Basically, that's the cleric spell Bless. And then it has the reaction of parry. A knight adds plus two to its AC against one melee attack that would hit it. To do so, the, the knight must see the attacker and be wielding a melee weapon. Knights are warriors who pledge service to rulers, religious orders, and noble causes. A knight's alignment determines the extent to which a pledge is honored. Whether undertaking a quest or or patrolling a realm, a knight often travels with an entourage that includes squires and hirelings who are commoners. I would also say guards. Um, or at least the stat block guard. I don't know if you'd call them guards. Um, maybe just part of the retinue. So, well, one of the first things I would do... Um, even before we're going to touch race is I would probably change the great sword for a long sword and give it a shield that would bump the armor class up to 20 and instead of doing 2d6 plus 3 slashing it would do 1d8 plus 3 slashing or if wielded in two hands without the shield which if we're not going to give it a shield might as well keep the great sword but if the shield gets like broken or something uh that'd be a 1d10 plus 3 and one of the things that i would do so i would change that i'd give the the long sword and shield i would still keep the melee attack um again Pick a race, since it's wearing plate armor, dexterity doesn't matter for the knight. So, you know, if you, depending on if you're looking to make the knight as hard as you can, you wouldn't pick, say, an elf. But elf knights are a really cool idea. And I think that holds true for a lot of my suggestions on races is there is the you, you can pick the race that will optimize that will make that will make that stat block as hard as it can be. Or then there's the cool class idea. And sometimes those are the same choice. A lot of other times they're not because the cool class or the cool race is generally the kind that you don't often see and you usually see the um optimized classes or the optimized races so that's what i would do um you know humans make a good knight goliaths half orcs uh, anything that gives strength. And then if I were to make a knight harder, I would give it ranks in paladin. Or the fighter heading toward the champion. Or even cavalier. That is something that is in, I believe, Xanathar's Guide to Everything. I know we're not really going with those other books but it is an option also uh your knight could be a samurai um those have a lot of overlap so that's really what i would do with a knight um how would i use it either in combat or as a low level noble 
which is historically what knights were. Um, for alignment, there is there's a lot. Um, so with almost all of these, you can pick any alignment, and that's going to change a lot of how you roleplay them. But I think the knight is one of the few that their alignment is really important to think about. Because, you know, your shining bastion of goodness that we like to portray knights in uh, in our fantasy literature, they're obviously lawful good. But there are also, you know, the lawful, you know, the lawful neutral knight is the knight who just, they will adhere to the law no matter what. And that's always interesting. Um, personally, I I find that lawful neutral is one of the least well explored alignments. And then there's the lawful evil knight, which uh, seeks power and is very ambitious, uh, but does everything he does within the confines of the law, and is usually an oppressive tyrant. Or works for an oppressive tyrant. And then there are... You know, you've got your neutral good knights, which there's an argument that can be made that most of King Arthur's knights were neutral good. Especially the ones that went on the, on the Grail quest. Um, including Galahad, who found the Grail. And then there are your chaotic good knights who usually fight against a system, which is kind of weird because all knights have pledged their service. Um, but your chaotic good knight would be someone who is either a hedge knight, which is a knight that is, doesn't have land. Um, they're also called knight errants. Um... And maybe they're that, or maybe they pledged their service to what they thought was a good ideal, and then it later turned out that no, the person or organization that they pledged their service to is in fact evil, and now they're leading a rebellion against that. Um, I don't really know if there'd be any chaotic neutral, uh, or even true neutral knights. Although maybe like a true neutral knight would be uh, someone like in Oath of the Ancients Paladin. Something along those lines. And then if we go to Chaotic Evil, when I think most actual historical knights, I actually think of Chaotic Evil knights. Um where they're warlords and warriors and they're out for glory and battle and conquest and are, you know, might makes right and not awesome people at all. Now, granted, I'm sure there are plenty of knights who actually lived up to the code of chivalry and all of that, but most knights that are talked about in history were not awesome people. Um, even ones like Richard the Lionheart, he made a very terrible king. Um, he just he waged holy war, so we remember him as a good guy. And he had one of the best adversaries of all time in Saladin. So that's that's knights for you. Um, again, if you want to make them stronger, give them ranks of paladin. Um, pick an alignment and really think about what that alignment means. 
Uh, that's just good advice for any NPC, but I think it very much matters for the night. So thank you for tuning in. Make sure you tune in tomorrow for the next episode of The Stolen Land. And tune in next Wednesday as we continue our way through the Monster Manual and we deal with the Scout and the Spy. Thank you.